And welcome back. It's markets today. We are talking geopolitical risk. We start, we're talking global asset prices. We're talking domestic asset prices. And with us here to help us discuss some of these things at great length is Edwin Chui, who's the head of research at Dan Blair. Edwin, welcome back. Thank you. And uh, Edwin, I mean, I look at your weekly report. Mm -hmm. Not so good news. Mm -hmm. Obviously, top of the list is that the NSE 20 share, the benchmark 20, NSE 20 share index. Yep fell below 2600 for the first time in 10 years. I mean, Edwin, what, where is this bearish sentiment coming from the market? So I think uh, it's a general sentiment, especially among local institutional investors, yeah. that uh, there is no growth story in the equities market. Wow. And uh, I mean, there's been no listing for quite a while. Yeah. And uh, since, let's say, 2013, there's been regulation over regulation. So if you're not dealing with capping of interest rates, you're dealing with excess and maybe you're also dealing with VAT. Yeah. And all these things kind of claw away at you know, potential returns. So it's really not a growth market uh, right now. So the market is essentially investors are struggling to figure out the next growth story for exactly. prices. Exactly. But also we've seen some notable size of portfolio, foreign portfolio outflows on a net basis in the market. You think that there could be some high yielding markets elsewhere that they're moving into? So definitely in Africa, I would say, you know, markets like Nigeria are doing much better. Yeah, obviously so those even high profile listings. Exactly. Yeah. So they've had high profile listings. And even when you look at their, say, banking stocks, they're still, you know, cheaper, relatively speaking. So if you're looking at uh, value, uh, you don't see it in Kenya. And then again, there are also some issues that kind of stand in the way in Kenya. Number one is this conversation about the shilling. Yeah. You know, when you have uh, IMF saying the shilling is overvalued yeah. uh, by 17.5%, yeah. then the question is, uh, are you going to come in and risk losing that uh, that much over yeah. time? Mm -hmm. And then if you have this conversation about capping of interest rates and whether it's going to be removed or not, you know, that kind of creates this other level of uncertainty mm -hmm. among, you know, foreign investors. And so there's a bit of a wait and see from foreign investors. And then unfortunately, uh, on the local side, there's a sense of uh, we don't really want to be 6% up this quarter and then wiped out the next three quarters. Yeah. We'd rather be okay just you know, playing in the TBs and treasury bonds market. Okay, so uh, um, that's a very interesting point, but let's look at um, I mean, your summation of YTD performance. Okay. And uh, except the Faricom, I'm seeing and it's, it's actually uh, dominated by, I would call them small cap stocks. Sami Africa up 145%. Exactly. Uh, Longhorn Express, uh, but the, the trend of Safaricom is up there 24% YTD. Okay. But my, 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 my conversation around this has been okay, fine, we do have, we know that small cap stocks are yep. pretty liquid. Yes. But they're delivering alpha this year. Okay. How do you balance that? Is it that illiquidity is overplayed uh, or? Are they good or they are bad for portfolio generally? Because, I mean, look at, for instance, Samia Africa is up 45% YTD. Why won't this stock feature in a portfolio? So I think it's a, it's a question of liquidity, you're yeah. right. And then it's also a question of speculation. Yeah. Uh, and you see the underlying uh, drivers of these movements are retail investors. Yeah. Investors will typically read a news article on Business Daily. And, and make an investment decision. And make an investment that. decision. Yes. Uh, and then, you know, you have your more institutional regulated investors who have to do like fundamental analysis. Yeah. And when you look at some of these, you know, stocks, there's no fundamental case for investing in them. There's no growth story. Yeah. There's no compelling growth story. There's no compelling growth story. <laughs> yeah. That's a very interesting one. Mm -hmm. But also, um, top losers, obviously, you have Uchumi, Kenya, Mumias, Nation Media. What's the story around Uchumi and Mumias? Should, should we... I mean, what, what are your, I mean, you look at these stocks on a daily basis. Yeah. So we do have mm -hmm. some kind of an emerging theme around uh, these issues about integrity, yeah. uh, about corruption, and uh, also, you know, whether there is a significant shareholding by government-related entities. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a bit of a fear factor around those stocks. So you, you've seen, uh, you know, most of these stocks delay even announcing their results by more than six months. And that kind of gives you a picture of how almost dysfunctional you know, yeah. the underlying entities are. I think that's the biggest problem on that side. Okay. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Foreign activity, very heavy on BAT, breweries, equity, Safaricom. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole sort of thing from you around foreign activity on the market is, okay. how do you get them to expand the activity beyond the current basket of four stocks? 
and we see them, how do we extend for an activity on other stocks, like for instance, let's say, um, Kenya Re, Kenja, and we don't see much, but these are also very highly liquid stocks. It's just, I mean, you write sell-side notes to yes. find investors. Why aren't yes. you writing sell-side notes to some of these other no, I think counters? We no, I think we do, uh, and I think the one issue is something you've highlighted, liquidity. Yeah. You know, some of these are uh, foreign investors, even when they are coming into Kenya, they are looking at Kenya as a, some kind of a rounding off. Yes. You know, it's, they're not really coming to trade, you know, some kind of a rounding off. So they want to be able to come in and out. And so the calculation they are doing is how is it, how long will it take me to get 10 million shares of Kenya Re? Yeah. And it turns out it takes very long. Very long. And also the price has to move a lot over that period of time. Yeah. So the trading costs really become very high. So I, I think that's the issue. And then, of course, there is also some kind of a lack of um, investor relations by yeah. some of those stocks. Yeah. Because when, once you look at a stock like Safaricom, they are constantly going out there, yeah. doing their own investor roadshows, yeah. in addition to what we are doing as analysts. Yeah. So some of these stocks really, some of these companies really have to go out there and make the story. Yeah, I create more. I, I, I was, actually, I was from a discussion where we were discussing investor relations. Okay. And num we discussed a number of, number of stocks, yes. counters, yes. don't drive visibility. And even if you look at IR activities, they're very limited. They don't have IR calendar, they don't mm -hmm. have IR page on the website. Yes. They don't literally just engage, and I'm obviously for me, for you as a sales participant, you've had trouble even engaging some companies. Exactly. How, how do we fill this gap? We, we obviously, it's a big gap. IR is a big gap. How, how, have we thought about how we can fill this gap, for instance? So I would imagine it has to start, you know, from us and uh, the regulator yeah. engaging the companies more. Yeah. And I think one of the things that can happen that we also should highlight is even the information dissemination. Yes. You know, uh, you see companies that are dishing out very condensed uh, financial statements. That I you know, saw that with yeah, EABL. Yeah, that you can't really yes. analyze. You know, you, you have like one cost line item. Yeah. You have like one revenue I line yeah. item. Yeah. And so, you know, when you are trying to make that case to a foreign investor, they want to know what, what are the underlying you know, yes. drivers. What are I mean, I had a trouble, and, uh, for instance, analyzing East African Broadway's results for mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fully ended June 2019. Yes. Yeah, because the, the, the release was so condensed. Exactly. And I was like, this can't help me make an investment decision. Like I want to see more line items, but the results was, you no, know, I have to wait for the annual report, which comes out in probably the release is in about two months. Yes. But that's too late. It's too late. It's extremely it's too, too, late. Late. too late. And I agree with you on that, uh, on the disclosure. I think the disclosure today is not very, do you think that the NSC, as, as, a, as the Nairobi Security Ex Exchange as a platform, should actually enforce certain minimum disclosure standards? I think I would say so, because once you look at what's really doing well, it's either banking, banking yeah. stuff, which already have the central bank kind of enforcing some kind of a, you know, disclosure st yes. structure. And it's quarterly. And it's quarterly. And it's mandatory. And it's mandatory. Yeah. So there is a way, you know, for people to independently, you know, analyze the numbers and come up with their own view. Yeah. And then you have, you know, entities like uh, Safaricom that are, you know, committed to doing... Which is vo voluntary, it's on a voluntary basis, voluntary. yes. So I think uh, NSC, yeah, definitely. I would be happy to see that. I would be happy to see that. So it's probably one of the reforms they need to make yeah. on, on that front. But um, tell me, so it's a Monday. Mm -hmm. what's, what, are you, what strategies are you likely to give your investors, clients for this week? So local investors are way more buy and hold investors yeah, compared yeah. to foreign investors, right? And once you look at uh, stocks from a dividend yield standpoint, there's no reason why foreign investors are not, uh, local investors are not buying back this bank. Yeah. It's about 10%. 10%, just slightly over 10%. No reason dividend why yield, you're yes. not buying standard charter, that's 9.6. Yeah. No reason why you're not buying cooperative bank, that's 8.3. All that is above your 364 yield, above Which your Which is about eight, eight and a half percent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think uh, even if you worry about potential capital gains, yeah. there's no reason not to buy that dividend today. Yeah, so it's a pure yeah. dividend play it's for you, I mean, for now. Yes. B in the absence of a, a compelling growth story. Yes. For a number of, yes. obviously for banks, you mentioned banks, it's very interesting that um, the interested cap discussion is now coming up the next couple of weeks. Yes. Uh, obviously you say that you don't see it, I mean, I don't see it being removed. Mm -hmm. But uh, are you factoring in, what are you factoring in your valuations for banks? Are you factoring in a, a slight adjustment or are you factoring a no, no action? I think whether caps uh, go or not, ba banks have to resume lending. You know, once you look at equity bank, the 
the good thing from the results now is that they seem to have resumed some yeah, kind of Yeah, I saw of the lending. loan book grow 16% year exactly. in year, which was quite exactly. surprising. Quite surprising and, and important because a key part of, let's say, equity bank is non-funded income, yeah. which comes from fees and commissions. Yeah. And the biggest line item under there it's is funded actually income. fees and loans. Yes, yes, right? yes. So you, you actually have to be lending to do well. And then uh, uh, when you look at government security side, the yields have really dropped. Yeah, we're talking about 15 year yielding 12.3 percent. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's 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 that's, that's for a 15 year lending. That's very low. That's, that's very low. So there are yes. there are no more fundamental base opportunities yeah. in in government securities yeah. from a yield standpoint. Okay, so it means that these banks should really start lending in some way. In any case, banks derive 70 percent of the revenues from funding activities from funding activities. yeah which and and over six percent is from loan book activity so if they're yes. not lending it will actually concern investors let's talk about equity you just looked at the q2 results what yes. do you take so i think the results were not uh strong yeah. that's number one uh you know looking on a relative basis and as i said i think the key positive for me is that the bank is lending again yeah so uh equity kind of pursued this strategy of uh, reallocating towards government securities after the caps came into place. Yeah, and they stuck to it for like two years. And that was a good strategy in the first year, but not in 2018, and wasn't going to be a good strategy in, in 2019. 2019 definitely. Yes. So I'm, I'm kind of happy to see them start lending. I think there are some questions uh, that can be raised around uh, you know, NPLs and how quickly we can see some kind of a material resolution. Yeah. And then there are some questions that we can raise around um, this potential transaction that I still don't see uh, merit in. You're talking uh, about Atlas Mara? Atlas Mara. Yeah. I still don't see merit in, you know, in terms Why of... Why do you say that? Is it that you don't... You don't you, have you, is it a, is, are you saying that from the basis that you don't like the quality of the assets they're buying? Or? Yes. So the quality of the assets they are buying, uh, I'm not. Sh I don't like them. Especially sure. the Tanzania and, and Mozambique units. Exactly. Yeah, Tanzania's unit asset has been struggling for some time. Exactly. They need to pump in more capital. Exactly. Yes. So they will need to pump in more capital, and there is a question whether they will actually have, uh, they have that capital to like just you know yeah. pump in. So I like the Ethiopia story. Uh, you know, having a rep office there. In so far as that market opens, I think. That is probably the most exciting market in the yeah. continent right now. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Well, you just have to do with uh, a lot of political uncertainty in Ethiopia. They could wake up and switch off internet any time. Yeah, I, I, I think they could. But I that's the cost of doing business in Ethiopia. It's a cost of doing business. Yes. And I think over time, um, every change becomes a benchmark. Yeah. So I, I don't think even if e Ethiopia has some kind of a, you know, a slid backwards, uh, I don't think it's going to be back to where they were. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think just to give our viewers update is equity a couple of months ago equity announced a short swap transaction between Atlas Mara and Equity Bank to the extent that they're gonna give so the equity group will give Atlas Mara shares in the group in exchange for banking operations in Zambia, Mozambique, Rwanda and, and Tanzania. And Tanzania. Yep. Yeah, you could say the Tanzan the Zambian bank is is, is is doing very well, which is mm -hmm. Atlas Mara Zambia. You could say doing very well, but the rest of them what do you think of the Zam Rwandan banking sector? They're buying BPR mm -hmm. which is So I think Rwanda Rwanda itself as a as you know, a macro is actually good. The problem is that it's too small. Yeah. Uh, and I think you do have some established uh, banks that are a bit bigger, so it's going to be a bit more competitive. Yeah. I think uh, Tanzania, uh, it's also now a question of politics and government. Yeah, Tanzania yeah, is uh, yeah. a very significant political state. The way the president could wake up and do anything else. And do anything. But uh, Edwin, tell me about the value. Uh, you've looked at the valuations. I yes. think they're putting it just roughly about $100 million in the, yes. the total value of the transaction. Yes. Um, yeah, equi equity will issue uh, shares to Atlas worth about $100 million, which is Kenya Shillings 10 billion shares. Have you, yes. Do you think they're overpaying or this is a fair valuation? I, I think it's a. Uh, it's an interesting question yeah. because we do not know yet exactly what they're paying for. Okay. So uh, from the briefing last week, the, the announcement was they need, they need to wait a little bit more to give us you know, more information in yeah. terms of uh, the kind of proposal they have given. Because remember what we have is only like an initial term sheet that is not necessarily binding. You know, in fact, it was interesting to me, the language that I heard from the briefing was, this transaction could take a very long time. 
Oh, really? Yeah. That's the, that's there, was, there was a question, an immediate question about the macro space in Zambia. And there was a, the answer was, you know, we are only going to assume that situation when we get there. So that's that a of, very scary statement, yes, yes, right? Coming yes, from, yes. from the group. Yes. Obviously, Zambia, lots of things happening, being downgraded to junk, currency issues. Um, let's wait and see how that happens. I mean, for, and I would want to look at probably foreign, foreign exchange translation gains or losses and equity groups results probably mm -hmm. a big impact on on that but the, the shutdown to south sudan south sudan is out of business now it's out of business yeah uh are you are you reporting or <laughs> i'm asking <laughs> a question no i, I mean i think they are they still managing south the sudan, license yes. yeah. yeah i think they're still managing the license because you gotta wait uh, and see what happens remember south sudan is still a very interesting market because it's an economy that doesn't have uh much that actually would have to happen, yeah. right? So you have uh, tax revenue and oil pretty much uh, yeah. kind of facilitating banking transactions. Yeah. So there's a lot more that would have to come into play assuming there is peace and stability. And I think in my view, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that South Sudan is going to get to a point of peace and stability, yeah. which will create room for more economic transactions outside the oil sector. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, lot of uh, bank corporate actions coming up this week. Stand be releasing on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. KCB next week. Mm -hmm. Potentially corporate. Mm -hmm. So the corporate bank also releasing next week. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you have um, an earnings expectations on this, some of these banks? Are you very bullish on Q2 results for some of these banks? So I think I'm only bullish, and I have actually only been bullish on uh, KCB Bank. Yeah. In my view, uh, KCB has had the better strategy yeah. uh, coming into 2018 and 2019. Yeah. And in fact, uh, if you look at, you know, like equities numbers, a 12 billion uh, profit as at 1H19, yeah. that's still less than KCB's profit. Are you going, to go, in, are you going to go into this race, this numbers at race between KCB? At 1H18. Yes. I mean, it's, it's important to highlight that yeah. because the difference has not always been that uh, significant, yeah. but it might be now. I think uh, you have to make, you know, case for equity's ability to move, you know, yeah. be agile and respond while underlining that maybe the strategy was wrong and it's a good thing that they are changing it. Okay. Um, you, you, do you have a view, we've not discussed this at length, but do you, have a, do you think that IFRS 9 will, will have an impact on p &Ls? I don't. I still think there is a lot of room and I don't understand why. Yeah. Uh, in terms of how you know some of these uh, banks are carrying out their financials, so I don't actually expect any, it's, any it's significant. It's business as usual. It's business as it's usual. Business as in usual. my view, in my view, uh, I, I was expecting to see it in uh, in the first quarter. I yeah, didn't, you didn't see it. I didn't see that correction that I thought would happen in the cost of risk going to two point something percent across the entire sector. I didn't yeah. see that. So I do not expect that to happen. The cost of risk is still very flat. It's still very flat. Yeah. And I guess, you know, they have a loophole in saying that we are not actually actively lending. And if we did our stage one adoption as at, you know, 2018, then we probably don't have any new loans that have really deteriorated for yeah. us to adjust. Yeah. So, and the only gatekeeper in our process, you know, as far as I can see is the auditor, who only gets to see those numbers at the end of the year. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I feel like uh, my argument has always been that I don't think an IFRS 9 is actually for our viewers. IFRS 9 is well, it's International Financial Reporting Standards, which came into force January 2018. And the key change is that banks are going to look at asset performance or assets and performance, loan and performance generally from an expectations point of view. I mean, historically, the previous model was banks were only provisioning after event has occurred, yes. now they have to anticipate an they event have to anticipate, yes. and take a provision on that, yes. uh, an yes. impairment adjustment on, on, that, on that front. Okay. But for me, I think my view is that it, it also introduces a lot of assumptions. That yes. it's, it's, it doesn't take away that element of risk subjectivity. For no, I mean, no, I can no, take no. a classical example. For instance, Ken, Kenya Airways has ex exposure to about 10 domestic banks. And yes. if you go to these domestic banks, yes. even the IFRS 9, you'll find that the classification varies. Some of them is in stage three. Yes. Some of them is in stage one. Yes. It just doesn't take that risk subjectivity away. Yes. I'm just wondering what will cure this for banks. I mean, banks are very innovative when it comes to accounting. I mean, one of the things that uh, kind of 
I think about is, you know, a lot of these regulations reflect, uh, you know, an original sin syndrome, right? Because <laughs> it's not really contextualized yeah. very well. It's yeah. not been, you know, part of the reason why I think uh, NPLs and recoveries are so slow is because we are lending purely against physical collateral, you know, title yeah. deed property, yes. Yes. which is very, very difficult yeah. to uh, recover. Yeah. So we don't have cash flow based lending, if I can say that. And banks don't like it. Yeah. And typically and cash, flow like it. cash flow based lending is probably more mostly in project finance yes. uh, cases. Yes. Um, Edwin, it's 3 p.m., it's just slightly past 3 p.m., the market has not closed. And the primary reason is that the market opened late, it opened at about 11.30, and it's likely to extend trading for another one and a half, two hours. So that that's why the market, we're not ringing the closing bell today because the market opened late. But let's go on with the discussion with Edwin. Geopolitical risks, trade tensions, mm -hmm. Strait of Hormuz, mm -hmm. Hong Kong protests, India, Kashmir, a lot of things happening today. Mm -hmm. We are likely, to, we are starting to see these things feeding into into global asset prices. What are some of the geopolitical risks that are keeping you awake now? So I think the key one is uh, China-US yeah. uh, trade conflict and the fact that uh, they just keep escalating. Yeah. You know? uh, I mean, these are people who should be able to just get in a room somewhere and iron these things out. And I think these are uh, expectations that are not being met, especially from you know the Trump administration. And so the response, unfortunately, for them is to escalate. Yeah. So the question is, how far uh, will this go? I think as far as we are concerned, China is the biggest market in the EMs, yeah. in the F FM. So if yeah. there is anything affecting China, everyone gets affected. Yeah. And uh, we are also not really prepared to take advantage of any of these things, right? We are not a manufacturing economy. That's a problem. Yes. That's a big problem right yes. there. Yeah. So, so another key thing is Brexit. Uh, but again, we can't really benefit because we are not a manufacturing economy. So if we were, uh, this would be like the opportune time to actually renegotiate. You know, a trade deal. A trade with the deal UK. with the UK. Yeah. And maybe they need to negotiate a visa deal. A visa deal maybe? Yeah. yeah. The yeah. visa process is ridiculous. <laughs> if you've gone through it. Yes. yes. But let's talk about fixed income now. Obviously, mm -hmm. turnover was up last week mm -hmm. um, what's what's driving fixed income training right now so fixed income now uh, I think the one key point to highlight is it's our liquidity it's all about liquidity and liquidity is really all about uh, government payments all has been uh, for the most part and the other key thing to highlight is that as far as I can tell the yields should be should have bottomed out you know it's it's really hard to see how yields keep dropping when you have inflation at 6.2, 6.3 percent. It's actually at 6.3 percent now. 6.3 percent. Yeah. And you have, you know, your 91 day yield at 6.4, 6.6 percent. Like you're not making any money in real yeah. terms. Yeah. So there is a conversation around that that needs to happen in terms of are we prepared, fund managers, investors, are we prepared for the kind of volatility that will come if there is anything that can change the direction of interest rates. And this anything is capping of interest rates. Yeah. If we have this announcement today, yeah. George, I'm telling you, yields will shoot up tomorrow. Immediately. We'll shoot up tomorrow because all the pricing, all the quotes that have been given out will be withdrawn. And that means most portfolio managers would be underwater. Most portfolio managers would suffer because I think there is some kind of a, an issue around how uh, you amortize a portfolio that's mark to market. Yeah. You know? It's yeah. not very smooth. Yeah. So it's going to it's going to require a bit more conversation with the trustees yes. that are not always very <laughs> You talk about good. trustees. Yes. That's not a very nice conversation. Those are not always good. Yeah. So essentially we're just saying that the current downdraft on yields is very is basically artificial. I think right now it's artificial yeah. because it's entirely driven by the fact that all money is moving towards fixed income, you know. Uh, real estate is underperforming. Yeah. So money that was going there or will go there is going into fixed income. Fund managers are reallocating aggressively, aggressively towards uh, you know, fixed income, especially in primary auctions. Yeah. And then you've got the banks that have been playing in that space for the last two, three years. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously the center bank is auctioning, um, I think they've announced an auction this month, right? A 10 year and a reopening of a 20. And that's the interesting thing. Eh? A 10 year is becoming like a short term paper right now. When did 10 years become short-term short paper? 
In fact, my expectation is that you're going to see an oversubscription yeah. in the tenure paper because there's nowhere else to put uh, money and generate significant returns. So what happens is, in my view, I think it's definitely easier to convert government securities into loans mm -hmm. from a banking standpoint, but it's very, it's less, uh, it's less easy for other institutional investors to do the same kind of conversion very quickly. So if you believe that the general health of the economy is not that great, and then you remove the caps, then it means this kind of liquidity we are seeing is going to kind of start thinning out yeah. over time. And it's liquidity is always cyclic anyway. It's always cyclic, yeah. yes, yes, yes. And you talk about uh, yields coming down, I'm seeing the table here. Is Mm -hmm. Bond prices is so much premium, you know. It's trading is like all of them trading at above 100. This is so much premium. So much premium on the IFBs. Actually, the IFBs are trading as the largest premium. This is obviously the fact that IFBs are tax exempt playing into this. Yeah, but, but it only plays into that when it comes to, let's say, high net worth investors and, and uh, foreign investors. Yeah. Because pension uh, fund investors are tax exempt anyway, regardless of the type of bond. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the yield curve, have you seen something interesting and something that interests on the yield curve? So, n nothing interesting. I think my recommendation is play mid. Yeah. Uh, so, play actually 7 to 10. Yeah. Uh, that's to my recommendation now. Mm -hmm. Because on the very long end, you have you know, total flatness. Yeah. And then you have duration risk. Yeah. That would be, you know, over pronounced if the curves were to go. And then on the long end, you have like nothing. You have no, no money in real terms. Yeah. Really. Yeah. But my last question, Edwin, on this conversation of fixed income, is the treasury, sorry, is it that, I don't know if there's a treasury, but effectively KRA has failed to meet the fiscal 20 year, 2018-2019 revenue targets. It okay. came in at uh, 1.44. Yep. The target was about 1.5. Okay. Um, what does that mean? What, what does that, should that send some triggers for the current fiscal year in terms of spending plans? Uh, in terms of, uh, yes, it should. Yes. They should cut down spending. Ideally. If that's ideal. Yeah. They should cut down spending. But I think it also tells investors that the numbers you get at the outset of fiscal deficits and all that, you can't really use them. You can't plan around them because the deficit is going to be much bigger. Much bigger. Much bigger all yeah. the time. And, you know, I do think actually that uh, Kenya Revenue Authority has done a great job yeah. uh, given the circumstances. Yeah. It's only that I think the targets have been super <laughs> over-ambitious. <Yeah. laughs> yes. The being given astronomical targets should be... But you talk about fiscal deficit. I mean, sh it, that means the actual fiscal deficit, especially for this year, in terms of our turn, could actually be much larger than the 5.6 of, of GDP they're oh, projecting. Will be. Oh, it will but be. shouldn't the interest rates reflect this? Should we have an upward adjustment on interest rates to reflect this kind you of you should, fiscal you sh position? You should if you didn't have the caps in place. Okay, sorry. Yeah. The, I, I missed the conversation on the caps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Edwin, that's very nice having you. It's a very skin-related discussion. That was Edwin Chi, who is the head of research at Dan Blair, taking us through geopolitical risks, fixed income, and obviously the fiscal space, you should expect, and obviously should expect sustained bottoming down of, in, of the yields, but Edwin says this is large artificial. She's calling for a caution, but on the fixed income, Edwin is saying you should be on the mid, that's about seven to 10 years. On the equity side, play dividend yields. This has been the market show today. We see you tomorrow, but we leave you with commodity prices.